like to thank the Rachel Carson Center for this great opportunity to share my ongoing research with the graduate students, my fellow fellows, uh, and the broader LMU community. The, the title of my talk today and of the book project uh, is Prometheus Bound, Environmental Crisis in the Developmental State in Modern China. Before I get into the project, I want to tell you what some of the fundamental analytical questions driving it are. One of the things that really is interesting to me is whether historical scholarship can identify the causes, at least some of the causes, of China's current environmental crisis. If it can, is part of that answer in, China, in China's developmental trajectory over the course of the 20th century? In what ways is China's developmental trajectory then over the course of the 20th century unique to China and distinctive and exceptional? In what ways is that developmental path common uh, among many societies over the course of the 20th century? Um, finally, um, in, is there light at the end of the tunnel? That is, can historical scholarship and a rereading of the Chinese classics point to some form of ecological modernization or green growth or sustainable development for China in the 21st century? There's a, a book in the field called As China Goes, So Goes the World. And that's describing consumption and economy, but I think that question or that phrase could be a applied equally to China's environmental and ecological dynamics in the 21st century. So at a methodological level then, can we force history to speak to policy in ways that can point China to a greener future or a less brown future at least in the 21st century? So in this talk, I am going to trace an arc of change over time and explain the causality behind those changes. I'll first start off by describing traditional patterns of political economy and ecology in China up through the 1900s. I will then explain why there was a radical disjuncture that took place uh, in the late 19th and the early 20th century, outline the core of my argument. Then I will walk us quickly through four specific case studies dealing with minerals, with water, with soil, and with air, four elements that illustrate these developmental dynamics over four different time periods in four different geographic regions. Uh, and then in the end, I will revisit this question of compelling history to engage with policy in trying to identify hopeful signs of some form of ecological modernization or um, uh, some kind of green growth, sustainable development for China in the 21st century. So first, let's start by taking a look briefly at the dominant patterns of political economy and ecology prior to this important change that I identify taking place at the end of the 19th century. What did it look like? Well, for a number of centuries, uh, successive Chinese dynasties had been intent on the reproduction of a stable agrarian order in pursuit of development, what I might call developmental parity. That's my conceptual and analytical category, not theirs. It's not their political vocabulary. Richer parts of the Qing Empire, in particular in the southeast, would provide interprovincial assistance, xiexiang, to poorer parts of the empire, particularly in the north and west to ensure some form of stability and also to consolidate the state's military and political control of newly integrated regions into the empire, again, particularly in the north and west, contemporary Xinjiang, Tibet, Qinghai, etc. If we had to describe the state's approach, we might suggest that it in, engaged in a kind of episodic agrarian developmentalism. The Qing Empire and its, uh, and its predecessors were not a developmental state, but they could assume a kind of activist role where, there, where they identified an important need for, for example, agrarian development. One particular phrase that shows up very frequently uh, in the statecraft or Jing Shi 
extra documents in the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th century is this idea of encouraging agriculture, chen nong, in an effort to store value among the people, cang fu yu min. After the state stepped in and encouraged, uh, for example, agricultural development in a border region, then it would step back from its uh, interventionary role and allow typically market activity, private activity, to step into the vacuum. So far, so good. But by the, certainly by the 1800s, there were too many people in China. It's very difficult to measure demographic growth uh, in a pre-modern environment lacking scientific statistics, but we estimate there are about 400 million people living in the Qing Empire by 1800. And as a result, a Malthusian dynamic took root. And as by certainly 1850, arguably by 1800, we begin to see systemic environmental and ecological stresses throughout most of China and ecological crisis in certain specific regions, particularly the North China Plain and particularly the arid Northwest. So uh, the entire system is clearly bearing the strains of too many people on too limited a resource base by 1800, 1850, and some regions have entered crisis mode already. Um, throughout China, most of the trees have been chopped down. Tree cover is probably down to somewhere between 5 and 10 percent by 1850. Soil has eroded uh, because of unsustainable farming practices throughout many regions of the empire. There are real severe ecological stresses, strains, and constraints on growth. Okay, so that's the kind of overview of the situation up to about 1850. Now I argue a very substantial change took place beginning after 1895. In the 19th century, the European powers, the Americans, and later Japan imposed a series of unequal treaties on China that violated its sovereignty. Uh, these included rights of extraterritoriality, most favored nation status, fixing um, uh, tariffs at uh, low fixed rates to encourage the penetration of Chinese markets by foreign goods. And this predatory international environment, a kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world, led to a radical transformation in Chinese statecraft and also a radical transformation in the ways that the state and people engaged with the natural world. After 1895, as the threat of European imperialism deepened, I argue, the Qing state and its successor regimes in the 20th century adopted what I call a Promethean political ecology, an unusually ruthless, increasingly systematized, and open-ended effort to transform the natural world in ways that enhance governmental power. Right, so the earlier Qing state had engaged in this kind of sporadic um, uh, agrarian developmentalism. There's a fundamental break. This is qualitatively different. Elements like minerals, water, soil, and energy were identified as the keys to fu xiang, to wealth and power, uh, and therefore were seen as the key to preventing further encroachments on China's sovereignty, which was a new concept that entered political vocabulary in China in the late 19th century, first with a very clunky construction, zi zhu zhi quan, later after 1895 with a borrowing from Japanese, zhu uh, and a fundamental transformation in, uh, of the view of resources um, in what is considered a value and what is considered production and productive value. The shift away from agriculture in part to, um, to other things like uh, water and minerals. Uh, over time, the imperial powers aren't really threatening China as directly. It, it becomes the Japanese in the 1920s and 30s, later the Cold War superpowers. But 
Mastering, and I use scare quotes around that term, mastering the natural world really became seen as the means of successive regimes, the Qing Dynasty, later the Republic, the Maoist period, uh, and the Contemporary Era, to amassing the sinews of state power and demonstrating that power both at home and abroad. So the fundamental uh, transformation in the basic conceptions of statecraft, the basic political vocabulary behind uh, Chinese um, and, uh, well, Qing and then later Chinese government policies, that is caused by the foreign threat. Okay. What does the state want to do? Well, it sees some form of development as the key to securing its sovereignty uh, and uh, safeguarding its independence and its borders against predation. Again, first by the European powers in the US, later by the Japanese, uh, still in a later period by the Cold War superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union. The uh, nature of that developmentalism is a little unclear, however. First, the Qing state, but later its successors, really wanted to pursue a form of what I call modernist developmentalism. And here I go back to one of my driving questions. What does China's development have in common with other societies? Well, I argue that most societies over the course of the 20th century wanted to pursue some form of modernist developmentalism, which rested on the adoption of fossil fuel energy regimes, on technocratic planning, on state management of the commanding heights of the economy, on a quest for capital intensive industrialization, and also uh, state promotion of modernizing ideologies that emphasized mastering or conquering or exploiting nature. This was common to a great many societies over the course of the 20th century. There's nothing particularly unique uh, in China's preference for this particular form of modernist developmentalism in most cases. Yet in examining the historical record of the 20th century, we find that time and again, policymakers, politicians, even ordinary people bumped into the ecological, the material, and the knowledge constraints in place in China before the onset of modern growth. That's what's distinct about China's developmental path in the 20th century. It wants to pursue this modernist form of development, but because of literally the contours of the natural world that it inherits from previous centuries, it is instead forced time and again to turn to a different form of developmentalism, which I call involutionary developmentalism. Involutionary developmentalism is low tech, it's low cost, it's labor intensive, and it is inefficient in scare quotes. So if we look at China's developmental record over the course of the 20th century, we can think of modernist development as a kind of melody, but involutionary developmentalism as a kind of contrapuntal theme. Time and again, the state chooses to pursue this modernist developmentalism, but runs into ecological, environmental, uh, material, and knowledge constraints that forces it to fall back on involutionary developmentalism. Together, these two forms of developmentalism produced an unusually anthropogenic landscape in China that is susceptible to rapid deterioration in almost any location without continual oversight and a continual investment of material and energy resources. China is, over the course of the 20th century, Prometheus bound. These Promethean urges run into the constraints I've mentioned, and it is only in the reform era after 1978 that Prometheus becomes unbound, right? That it is possible fundamentally to escape the legacy uh, of the imperial past. So that's an outline of the core argument. Next, we're going to walk through four specific case studies quite briefly that illustrate this developmental dynamic, this effort to pursue modernist development, but then having to fall back, back on involutionary forms of development in different regions uh, and with different materials. Okay, so 
The book project consists of four case studies. There we go. The book project consists of four case studies across time. The purpose of the four case studies is to connect threads of continuity geographically and temporally. They're by choice geographically disparate and chronologically sequential to illustrate the way that there are continuous themes, continuous historical threads that unite them together and that illustrate the broader argument. The first study focuses on minerals uh, and is centered in central China. Um, a particular complex of iron and steel smelter coal mines and iron mines, which is in fact the city, Wuhan, is the epicenter of the current coronavirus um, epidemic. So that particular case study deals with the late imperial era. We then shift to the, a different element, water, uh, in the 1920s and 30s centered on uh, uh, water conservation uh, and development in the Huai River Valley under the Republican government. We then take a look at the element of soil uh, in the 1950s and 60s in the Maoist era, looking at a particular idea of Caoyuan Jianche, or grasslands construction. Um, what does, how possibly could steppe environments relate to a heavy industrialization drive undertaken uh, under the communist regime? And then finally, we take a look at air quality uh, in the reform era um, in, to, from roughly 1995 to present, uh, specifically the ways that electricity production related to coal power plants have an adverse impact on the quality of air uh, in the most developed part of China down here in the Pearl River Delta. And that particular case study is different and distinct from the others in suggesting that the bound Prometheus becomes unbound because of changes I will mention uh, in a few minutes. So let me walk you through each of these four case studies briefly to illustrate the ways that they illuminate this pattern of a bound Prometheus pursuing modernist developmentalism, but then bumping up into ecological material and knowledge constraints in, uh, in place and in force before the onset of modern growth. So the first case study, uh, as I mentioned, focuses on uh, a region in South Central China which has uh, acquired the notoriety, undesired, of being the epicenter of the current coronavirus outbreak. In the late imperial era, so roughly after 1895 up until the end of the dynasty in 1911, the Qing realized that it needed to industrialize, at least in modest ways, if it wanted to survive in a competitive, predatory international order in which weak states were swallowed up and destroyed by stronger imperial powers. So the first two elements of a developmental state were put in place in this early period. The Qing are not a developmental state. That doesn't emerge really until the 1920s and 30s. But two crucial elements, two important uh, stones in the foundation are put in place. First, the pursuit of capital and knowledge intensive industrialization. And second, the adoption of fossil fuel energy regimes. The other elements of the developmental state would wait several decades before they appear. One of the examples of this is this particular case study that I point to. It was called the Hanya Pingong, so the Hanya Ping Company, which combined iron and steel smelting, particularly for the construction of railroads and also for armaments with uh, modernizing forms of coal mining uh, at the Pingxiang coal mines, the Pingxiang colliery, and the Daye iron mines, uh, which you see on the slide. Right? So the Daye iron mines are obviously still active even in the 21st century. This is the smelter put up in Wuhan uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and here are the largely defunct Pingxiang coal mines. So the idea is to, that um, 
modernist forms of mining and manufacturing can be placed in the service of pursuing wealth and power and amassing the sinews of power necessary to safeguard China's sovereignty, eventually to throw off the yoke of unequal treaties that had been imposed upon it over the course of the 19th century by Europeans, Americans, and later Japanese. This particular enterprise was state-sponsored, but drew heavily uh, from private mercantile capital and private mercantile managerial expertise because the state didn't have access to it. At first, it was highly successful. For a time, there was a form of vertical integration that ensured the successful mining of coal and iron or its transportation to the smelting center in Wuhan and its reallocation in the form of raw iron and steel for armaments but also for China's nascent railroad network. But all was not well, right? Here's the, here's the constraint business, right? Modernist developmentalism in this case is not running into an ecological constraint per se. There's still plenty of coal and iron in the ground, but they run into knowledge constraints and material constraints in the form of capital. That is, there isn't enough money to fund this, and there isn't enough indigenous Chinese knowledge to sustain mastery of the technology, uh, and so the end of this is disastrous. Ultimately, the Han Yaping Company goes bankrupt, turns to the, the Japanese empire for funding um, and for management, and instead being an instrument of strengthening the late Qing state, it becomes a vehicle for Japanese imperial penetration of China. So here we see an effort to break through these developmental barriers, but these constraints are encountered and the outcome is a negative one. Throughout this entire period, traditional forms of mining coal, low-tech, labor-intensive, unsafe surface mining continues to supply the majority of fossil fuel needs in the Qing Empire. And it's so bad that coal has to be imported from Japan, of all places. So here we see, in this case study, uh, an effort to pursue unlimited breakneck development that then bumps into these very real constraints on growth. The second case study uh, focuses on water uh, and is, I'll show you where it is on the map. It's up here, the Huai River. The Huai River had been a perennial problem for Qing and later Chinese statecraft uh, because many dynasties had attempted to maintain an unsustainable water transport network centered on the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal runs north-south, the Huai River runs east-west, the Grand Canal crosses both the Yangtze River and the Yellow River, and in the 19th century, the Yellow River changed course. It used to flow south uh, of the Shandong Peninsula. At, between 1850 and 1853, it began to flow north of the peninsula. This created havoc with the Huai River, um, which found no uh, reliable outlet to the sea and led to continual flooding, uh, uh, particularly of the Huainan region here. Uh, with a com comitant breakdown of social order, a rise in banditry, uh, and perennial unsolvable flooding. Along comes the modernizing regime of the nationalist government between 1927 and 1937. Here we see the full articulation of a developmental state uh, iterated in the Nanjing regime. So added to those two earlier elements that appeared in the late Qing, we have technocratic planning. Uh, many of the officials and bureaucrats in the Nanjing government are highly trained. Many of them obtain degrees in Japan, in Europe, including Germany, and in the United States. Uh, and um, there is also state management of the commanding heights of the economy, at least within the limits of the regime's power, uh, and a, an ideology or a plan of development called nationalist construction, Guo Jia Jian She. It's not monolithic, it has internal variations, but it provides some kind of organizing principle. So additional elements of the developmental state are put in place, even though the national government's power is principally concentrated down here in the southeast. <laughs> 
Okay, so what does it want to do? It wants to fix the Huai River. It wants to repair almost irreparable ecological uh, damage that this unsustainable human anthropogenic system of the Grand Canal had created. It wants, in fact, to pursue integrated economic development based on the Tennessee Valley Authority in the United States with technocratic planners uh, reformulating how the Huai River worked at a fundamental level. It wants hydropower, it wants irrigation, it wants modernized transport, and also is interested in flood control. Many of the um, hydraulic engineers were trained in Europe and the United States uh, in, involved in this project. They have, um, they have the, these magnificent elaborate dreams that they choose to pursue, modernist forms of development. What they run into, however, are very real ecological constraints uh, and material constraints. So there's to be modern forms of uh, materials, concrete and reinforced steel, uh, hydraulic engineering, hydropower that powers this idea of nationalist reconstruction. It doesn't exactly come to naught, but the state is forced to fall back on an involutionary form of development. There are no earth movers. Basically, conscripts, including military conscripts, were sent to dig a drainage canal from the Huai River by hand over a course of a number of years. Low-tech, low-cost, labor-intensive. Uh, it is partially successful, but moves only a tiny volume uh, of the original planned amount that the drainage canal in this very technocratic scheme had envisioned. Um, and it all comes to naught because in 1938, Chiang Kai-shek blows up da dikes on the Yellow River to prevent the invading Japanese forces from making military progress and moving west. And the entire project is inundated in the end. An effort to pursue modernist development, uh, a very imperfect involutionary solution. Our next case study takes us uh, to a very different environment. It takes us to the semi-arid steppe environments of Inner Mongolia, named Mongu, and to a different historical period, the Maoist period from 1949 to 1976. In its early years, the new People's Republic of China, a communist regime, had in essence based its developmental schemes slavishly on those of the Soviet Union. Centralized planning, technocratic planning, capital intensive development, siphoning off agrarian surpluses to reinvest in a forced heavy industrialization plan. This did not meet with Mao's expectations or desires. And so beginning with the Great Leap Forward of 1958 to 1961, uh, later in, in the Cultural Revolution, there was a move away from these modernist developmental forms to involutionary developmental forms. The Great Leap Forward and the economic policies pursued during the Cultural Revolution are perhaps the apotheosis of involutionary development. In the rhetoric of the period, this debate was oftentimes framed as red versus expert, with red communist representing involutionary development. The aroused will of the mobilized Chinese masses will overcome structural impediments to economic development. The modernist developmentalism is the expert, which comes increasingly under pressure in the Maoist period. You'd think that these grasslands are as far away from some form of heavy industrialization as imaginable, and yet they too are implicated in both the red and the expert plans of development. In the uh, Maoist era, grain was taken as the, cre as the key link. Iliang Weigang. And so agrarian surpluses, even from places like Inner Mongolia, described as a wasteland, as Huang, were to be siphoned off and support a project of heavy industrialization. What changed in the Great Leap Forward and in the Cultural Revolution era is central planners weren't in charge. Right? This is the era of the infamous backyard furnaces, for example. In Inner Mongolia, of course, there, aren't, there are, actually, there are some backyard furnaces. Um, what it means is, for the most part, intensive agricultural development of steppe soils, 
right? Both to have additional agrarian production to support heavy industry, also fodder for animals to support unsustainably large herd sizes. At the same time, ethnic Mongolian populations are sedentarized, uh, and uh, there is effectively an end to nomadic lifestyles. Again, this is to support um, this form of heavy industrialization, but in the end it involves people with shovels uh, going into the steppe and trying to intensively farm uh, very shallow steppe soils susceptible to desertification and wind erosion. Uh, it's a failed project in the end. Having visited this particular, uh, particular area, Uxin Banner, the scars of these failed, ill-conceived agrarian developmental programs are still visible in the landscape as giant splotches of sandy desert. So there's an effort to pursue modernist developmentalism in the Maoist era, but once again, material constraints, ecological constraints are severe, and particularly the ecological constraints are severe in a grasslands environment. This brings us to case study four and the fourth element, air. I argue that in the reform era, finally Prometheus becomes unbound. That is, beginning in 1978 and the early 1980s, there is a move towards the privatization of agriculture and a move towards rural industrialization. This then provides the financial capital to pursue the modernist form of development that China had been so intent upon over the course of a century. Uh, and so the key to much of that development is manufacturing. The key to manufacturing uh, is energy, electricity, and that electricity comes disproportionately from coal-powered power plants. So uh, this has an extraordinarily deleterious effect on public health. The little red dots that you see uh, are the health impacts uh, and health impacts from coal-powered plants uh, and the amount of particulate matter that they emit into the atmosphere of China. So this particular case study, geographically, the core of it is the greater Pearl River Delta right here in Guangdong, but there is a broader iteration of regional identity called the Pan Pearl River Delta. The uh, core of it here is the most industrialized part of China and one of the wealthiest. Um, and over the course of the 1990s and 2000s, one of the most polluted precisely because uh, of the need for the electricity to drive the manufacturing sector. So um, these cities here you may have heard of, places like Shenzhen, for example, plus Hong Kong, Macau, but also places like Foshan, Dongguan, etc. Really kind of the, the key manufacturing area, era of China uh, in the reform era. This has very adverse repercussions for the rest of the region in terms of air quality. Uh, there have been efforts to solve that problem. We can talk more about them in the Q&A period. There's also broader regional repercussions. That is, a great deal of energy and electricity is transferred uh, from these western regions to Guangdong. It's called the West-East Energy Transfer Project. That means that Power plants, either hydro or coal, uh, in these provinces to the west that are less developed are having ecological impacts, but the energy is being transferred here uh, to the more developed Guangdong. So it's a classical kind of core hinterland scenario. Uh, moreover, there is not just electricity being transferred, but virtual water transfers. Right? So producing electricity eats up a great deal of water, and that places very substantial pressures on ecosystems in the far west as energy is being transferred down here to the northeast. Nonetheless, uh, Prometheus really does escape the trap in, in the reform era. So the state claims success. We can, we can talk about the ecological impact more uh, in the Q&A. So this really uh, brings me to the last section of the talk, uh, and that is prospects for sustainable development in the 21st century. Uh, I think that there are signs of hope, light at the end of the tunnel.
um, that there are multiple reasons for some degree of optimism. There, there are three developmental paradigms that people studying this think about. One is business as usual. The other end of the perspective, or the other end of the spectrum, the other perspective is sufficiency and post-capitalism. In the middle somewhere is sustainable development, ecological modernization, green growth. I think that there are some conditions for the possibility of a very imperfect form of ecological modernization or green growth in China. What are they? Well, briefly, they fall into three categories. One, I think it is possible to undertake a rereading of the Chinese classics with a kind of environmental consciousness. People writing at the time were not environmental activists, but there are certain ideas or threads or themes or motifs that can be teased out of, uh, of the Chinese classics, that they can become an intellectual resource to legitimate and sustain some form of green growth. So people often turn to Neo-Confucianism and even the older form, the Paleo version of Confucianism, for some idea of environmental stewardship. Right? Uh, so there's a kind of classic quote from the Analects, the master fishes with a pole and a line, but does not use a net. He goes hunting, but he will never shoot a bird that is sitting on a roost with its young. Right? So, the, the original is kind of in, in pursuit of some form of balance or temperance, but these kinds of ideas uh, can be reread with a modern environmental consciousness in mind. Taoist ontologies of Tian Ren He Yi, the idea that nature, which is a bad translation of Tian, but nature and humanity are ontologically indistinct, they're united. Uh, these are intellectual resources, I think, um, that can be mobilized in support of green forms of development. Moreover, there's a psychological aspect as well. Uh, in the 19th century, the way that China legitimated its own adoption of Western technology is steam, steamships, steam, uh, steam engines, was to say, oh, well, we actually came up with these ideas first thousands of years ago. The uh, Chinese origins of Western learning, xi xue zhong yuan. A similar psychological dynamic could be at work if one made the case that, oh, rereading the Chinese classics, we find that thousands of years ago there was already an idea of sustainable development. China thought of it first. So it seems less of an imposition politically from well-developed imperial powers that had violated the country's sovereignty systematically for a full century. So there are intellectual resources that could be used to legitimate uh, some form of some very imperfect form of ecological modernization or green growth. There are also um, what we might call developmental opportunities. That is, if we emphasize sustainable development as development, we emphasize green growth as growth, it is apt to be more appealing because it deeply resonates with the stated developmental goals of, uh, of the government. When it is clear that a profit is to be made, when it is clear that a strategic developmental and energy niche is to be occupied, may be monopolized by China within the global economy, it is apt to have a greater appeal. Why has solar power gotten so cheap the last decade or so in relative terms? Because the Chinese state has pumped $47 billion into developing the technology. That's why every five years, efficiency is doubling and cost is falling by half. So uh, with strong state support and state subsidization of various green technologies and renewables, it's clear that if the state's own Rhetoric can be replicated uh, if it's clear that green growth serves the stated developmental goals of the government, that it's going to be rather more appealing. The last kind of set uh, of hopeful ideas falls in uh, the realm of institutions. As China first became aware of environmental protection in 1972 when it attended a UN conference uh, with the, a delegation headed by Zhou Enlai. It gradually worked its way up to having a Ministry of Environmental Protection. That ministry is less powerful. Uh, 
than many others. But the fact that there is an institutional iteration of this, I, this need to protect the government, uh, to protect the environment by the government, is a hopeful sign. Moreover, there are important middle class movements at work as well. Not organized on a national scale, that's not possible, um, but an environmental awareness on the part of many middle class people, particularly professionals and urbanites, that is a hopeful sign. So together, looking at these three different categories, uh, looking at intellectual resources, looking at development strategies as development, uh, and then at these institutional and social expressions of environmental concern, there is, again, some cause for optimism, some form of very imperfect ecological modernization. Thank you.